The information that he had, this could spark a domestic debate on the role of the military and our foreign policy in general. That his actions would allow Americans to understand the true cost of war. I share Bradley Manning's belief that being informed <laughs> regarding the true cost of the military and U.S. foreign policy is essential to having a productive debate regarding the role of both. I hope tonight's presentation is able to make a small contribution to this goal. So let me start with just a brief history. And I also did, by the way, I meant to mention, passed out. There, everybody have a copy of the handout? It's got a little just outline of the talk so you can get a sense of where we're at as we're going along. There might be more copies over here. So a brief history, um, hopefully credible as much as maybe also incredible. <laughs> Following World War II, a conflagration that resulted in more than 60 million dead, millions more injured, mass starvation, and nations in ruin, Charles E. Wilson, the president of General Electric, a wartime contractor whose company, like Standard Oil, General Motors, Ford, IBM, and DuPont, made profits from investing on both sides of the war in Nazi Germany as well as Allied production. He was so happy about the wartime situation that he suggested a continuing alliance between business and the military for what he called a permanent war economy. The war had indeed, World War II, been good for corporate profits which rose from $6.4 billion in 1940 to more than $10 billion in 1944. The war was so profitable that corporate and finance capitalists were not about to live without such a lucrative source of guaranteed, taxpayer-derived, non-competitive revenues just because the war came officially to an end. And then I have my next slide. Hiroshima. In 1947, just a year after Charles Wilson was communicating along with the rest of his business colleagues about the value of continuing war, President Truman, who just two years earlier had given the green light to incinerate Hiroshima and Nagasaki with atomic weapons, articulated what became known as the Truman Doctrine, dividing the world between the freedom-hating godless communists on the one side, most notably the Soviet Union, Eastern Bloc, and China, and the God-fearing, freedom-loving capitalists on the other. The Soviets and the communist movement were presented as an international threat that demanded the U.S. maintain military forces and operations around the world. Truman's doctrine provided a largely unassailable rationale for making Charles Wilson's dream come true of a permanent war economy, providing the pretext for spending as if we might soon be at war, and also providing an enormous economic incentive for continuing to wage wars around the world. I want to note that the same time that Truman was articulating the Truman Doctrine and dividing the world up, people from around the world also gathered together to formulate and create the United Nations. Out of that work came as well, as you all know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so representatives from around the world came together and sought an alternative to war. And rather than divide the world between on the one side the communist and on the other side capitalist or the freedom-loving people, uh, this group said we could work together to resolve our differences to avoid ever having a war again. Truman's doctrine, on the other hand, provided the perfect, as I mentioned, uh, rationale for U.S. interventions around the world and what became known, as all of you know, as the Cold War. Between 1945 and the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, the U.S. carried out small and large-scale military, short and long-term military, I'm sorry, operations in scores of nations through direct and proxy military forces in all of these nations. And I included, and I won't read through the whole thing, but I'll give you a list of some of these, or at least, uh, highlight some of these. 
So on the left side of the board is a list of, and it's a short list of some of these interventions over the last 50 years, and then a map on the right focusing on the Americas. And let me just highlight a few of the interventions, and then draw some conclusions that are essential for us to appreciate. In Iran, in 1953, the U.S. helped to overthrow an elected government that had nationalized the oil revenues in Iran and installed the Shah of Iran, who set about the task of repressing all efforts to create a more democratic society. In Guatemala, in 1954, the following year, where having learned lessons from overthrowing the government in Iran, the U.S. helped again to overthrow an elected government that had made the mistake of redistributing land to poor people in Guatemala. Land by, owned by, at least in large measure, United Fruit Company, who were none too happy about the fact that this land was being redistributed for the use of people in Guatemala to grow food for themselves. In Vietnam, as you know, from 1960 to 1975, where the U.S. utilized every weapon at its disposal, including chemical and biological, everybody knows this, right? Agent Orange and other uh, weapon systems just short of nuclear weapons, although that was entertained in a serious way. There are tape recordings of Henry Kissinger talking to Nixon about the possibility, about even the necessity of using nuclear weapons in <laughs> Vietnam to prevent the Vietnamese who had struggled for decades to gain their independence. In Iraq, in 1963, where the U.S. helped to bring the Ba'ath Party and Saddam Hussein to power, where the U.S. helped to bring Saddam Hussein to power in 1963. In Guatemala, in Chile, on September 11th, 1973, where the U.S. again <coughs> intervened to overthrow a democratically elected government and install General, as you know, General Augusto Pinochet, who then set about reversing all the gains that had been made by the people of Chile at that time. Throughout the 1980s in El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Guatemala, and I can say on a personal note, this is where I really came to greater political awareness of what's happening around the world was what was going on in the 1980s in Latin America. I began to read a lot of liberation theology. There's been plenty of discussion about that in this last couple of weeks with the nomination of the new pope and his relationship to some of what was going on in Latin America at this time. The U.S. helped fund and train uh, death squads throughout Latin America who primarily targeted anyone who stood up for the rights of ordinary working people. In 1989, in Panama, where the U.S. ousted uh, President and former CIA asset Manuel Noriega and left 2,000 citizens dead. In Iraq, as you know, in the first Gulf War, where the U.S. intervened on behalf of the Kuwaiti oil monarchy and killed an estimated 200,000 Iraqi troops, even as they retreated under a white flag. To this list of military interventions, sorry, some of the images are missing, but you can look this up yourself uh, as well. Look up friendly dictators. The U.S. also has spent the last 50 years and all the way up to the present providing much in the way of military and financial support to some of the most repressive regimes in history. Uh, the picture in the middle, middle you might, at the top you might recognize is Ronald Reagan sitting with the Mujahideen who we referred to as freedom fighters. They were the people that the CIA funded by way of Pakistani uh, agencies to fight the Soviets in Afghanistan. And this included Osama bin Laden, among others, so providing the support. I've got some other images, as you know, um, our support for the Egyptian uh, President uh, Mubarak uh, and, and supporting him with the weapon systems as well that he kept or that he used to try and prevent uh, his own overthrow. In fact, what I want to say is citizen support for interventions over this 50-year period was and still is, as you know, secured by telling the American public that these operations are undertaken to make us safe, to protect our way of life, and to promote freedom and democracy. And yet, in virtually every case, and honestly, I looked very carefully at this, I could not find an exception. They have been undertaken to accomplish one of three goals. 
First, to prevent the development of national independence and democracy. Second, to overthrow an elected government and install corporate-friendly dictatorships or corporate-friendly formal democracies. And finally, to replace dictators who fail to follow orders from Washington or are no longer able to adequately to provide adequate access to their other nation's resources to foreign uh, ex exploration, foreign extraction. <coughs> With the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, there was, as there was following World War II as well, much talk and hope for a peace dividend. Uh, some of you in the room, uh, I know, may recall this, uh, this period of time where with the fall of communism, which had been the major rationale for spending as much money as we did over that 50-year period following uh, World War II, uh, that with the fall of the Soviet Union, the breakup of the Eastern Bloc countries, that we would have all this money at our disposal that could be used for all sorts of other purposes. And yet, almost immediately, the Clinton administration showed first no signs of diminishing the military budget and began to talk, as most political officials did, about a growing international threat from terrorism. The Oklahoma City bombings, the bombings of the embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, and then of course, most especially, the, I'll come to the budget stuff here, uh, most especially the September 11th attacks in 2001 provided exactly the kind of evidence to secure American support for continuing military spending. And not just continuing support, but growing support for escalating the amount of money that we would spend on the military. The September 11th attacks provided, in other words, precise I'd like to say otherwise, but it's the case that the current administration has not merely continued virtually all of the former administration's war on terrorism, military, <coughs> and security state policies, and, as you might have seen, provided Bush administration officials with blanket immunity from any prosecution or investigation of possible war crimes, but has sought to strengthen legal justification for Bush-era policies, including warrantless wiretapping, and other forms of spying and surveillance on Americans, indefinite detention, extraordinary rendition, government secrecy, and the right to violate international law, which many of us, unfortunately, are not taught enough about to have a real sense of what's at stake with that, whenever the president thinks doing so is necessary. The Obama administration has further institutionalized politically, economically, legally, and culturally militarism and the war on terror as a core dimension of our national identity and guiding principle for foreign policy. And now I have a couple of slides. Let me just say a bit about the extent of the current military industrial complex and some of the aspects of that. So on to the second part here of the presentation. In 1967, in his condemnation of the US war against the people of Vietnam, breaking the silence, Martin Luther King said that any nation that spends more on national defense than programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. 46 years later, 58%, I hope the slide comes up, well, listen, maybe I don't have, maybe didn't have to do it. Unfortunately, it didn't come through. So I think you've got it in the flyer mm -hmm. that 58% in 2011 of discretionary spending goes to military and security operations. The second largest category of discretionary spending is education at 6%. So 58% and then 6% on education. Note, too, that some portion of energy and environment, international affairs, and veterans' benefits constitute military-related expenditures, as well as no small portion of the debt that we have incurred over the last 10 years, bringing that portion of discretionary spending devoted to militarism to about 70%. That amount doesn't include, as well, the billions of dollars appropriated to wage the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and other military operations around the world. We were talking about this earlier, but Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel uh, Prize winning economist, 
uh, wrote a book that was published just a couple of years ago indicating that the total cost just for the war in Iraq was between three and five trillion dollars. So approaching one third of the where we're getting to in terms of national debt. In addition to these expenses, roughly 1,500,000 persons are on active duty in the Air Force, Army, Coast Guard, Marines. This figure does not include private contractors, which number in the potentially hundreds of thousands as well, so also constitute a large uh, sector of uh, the persons serving in the military. Um, the U.S. has the world's largest defense budget at a little bit more than 40% of the world's total spending. And if you add all of the aspects of that budget up, this is 2009, I think it's up a little bit higher than this even at this point, uh, we are annually over a trillion dollars just in defense spending alone every year. Somewhere between a trillion and a trillion and a half uh, dollars. And then I wanted just to show you uh, global bases around the world where the U.S. has uh, more than 700 military bases and installations uh, around the world where it's engaged in numerous kinds of operations. I also included here too, oh, um, I, I actually took some time to go through because I didn't really know that much about how does this spending, uh, where does it go. Uh, so I just put in for Google search uh, U.S. Air Force aircraft. And what you find if you do that for Navy vessels or for Marine and Army land vehicles are page after page after page of the things that our tax dollars are being used to uh, purchase. And it's quite remarkable to see uh, how long those lists are. So I have some here and I'll just simply note that these are at the top of the list um, I didn't want to just drag everybody through all the details here, but at the top of the list are a number of the all of uh, fighter jets, cargo planes, fuel retankers, and so a B-1 bomber. I'll just mention we have 66 of those at 283 million dollars a piece. 76 B-52 bombers at 53 million dollars a piece. 130. Hercules cargo aircraft at 283 at 62 million dollars a piece, and then because the uh, regular Hercules cargo plane wasn't sufficient, we had to have the Super Hercules cargo machine, which is 100 and 130 of those at 65 million dollars a piece. 400 F-15 Eagle and Strike Eagle fighters at 100 million dollars a piece. 840 F-16 fighter falcons at 18 million per unit. What a deal. <laughs> we could all get one of those. 195, 195 F-22 Raptor fighters at $150 million a piece. The cost of the annual budget for the College of Humanities and Sciences here at VCU is $50 million. The cost of one Raptor is, is three times that. So we could increase the number of faculty as we absolutely need to do. I'm making a pitch for my <laughs> workplace and for the students here who get ripped off all the time because this money is being spent here and not actually at colleges for education, making sure that we have uh, the best possible education we could get. On the other hand, Lockheed Martin is totally thrilled because they manufacture this jet. And one of the other striking features of this Research is, as you know, to find out that it wasn't good enough to have the Hornet. You have to have the Super Hornet as well. Because McDonnell Douglas has built in a planned obsolescence for these weapon systems. right? So they only last for a short period of time, and then they get sold. You should all know they all get sold to other countries, including countries that might turn around and use them against our own uh, service personnel right? when they're out around the world. Uh, I, at the bottom of the page, it gets into Navy ships, you know, 10 aircraft carriers, 6,434 Abrams tanks at $9 million a piece, 7,000 Bradley fighting vehicles at $3 million a piece, and so on and so forth. This does not include, I don't know if my last one slide is, Army the World, wait. This does not include nuclear weapons. So let me just say a, a word about nuclear weapons, if I'm all right for time at this point. Um, nuclear weapons. Uh, in 
addition to the thousands of conventional weapon systems, and I haven't talked about pistols and rifles and everything else, Charles, uh, or Chalmers Johnson indicates that at the beginning of the 21st century, the United States nuclear arsenal comprised 5,400 5, multiple megaton warheads atop intercontinental ballistic missiles based on land and at sea. An additional 1,750 nuclear bombs and cruise missiles ready to be launched from B-2 and B-52 bombers. So we can add all these up. And another 1,670 nuclear weapons classified as tactical, not fully deployed but available are an additional 10,000 or so nuclear warheads stored in bunkers, you'll all be happy to know, around the United States, and no doubt right here in the state of Virginia. The staggering overkill. I mean, I don't even know, maybe somebody sat down and figured out how many planet Earths you could totally destroy with that number of weapons, but as you probably know if you studied this, it wouldn't take more than probably 10 or 20 of these detonated around the world to make life on planet Earth utterly uninhabitable for most of us. Um, the staggering overkill in our nuclear arsenal and the lack of any rational connection between nuclear means and nuclear ends is further evidence of the rise to power of a, multi, of a militarist mindset. And I would add evidence of the influence of the weapons makers. The current uh, budget calls for $52 billion to be invested in the development of new nuclear weapons at this point in time under the Obama administration. We also lead the world in selling weapons to countries all over the world, by far and away. You can see that, and you can notice the trajectory here, right? Obama uh, elected in 08, so starting here, and look at how we've taken off in terms of the percentage of weapons we provide to countries around the world. And again, virtually without regulation, meaning they're sold to some of the most repressive regimes on the planet. Uh, obviously to the great um, pleasure of those who invest in and make money from selling weapons on the global market. The military industrial complex is, as you know as well, a political complex. It has our congressional uh, representatives and our president locked up in many respects by spending uh, millions of dollars a year lobbying Congress so that uh, they will vote in favor of weapon systems uh, weapon systems, the manufacturers of weapons, uh, understood this and made sure that most of their uh, weapons are manufactured in sites all across the country, in all 50 states, so that they secure congressional support across the country in the name of providing jobs. Many of our congressional representatives actually have significant investments in some of these same companies. So they vote in favor of generating another weapon system, precisely because their stock portfolio uh, comes back in the form of more money generated from this. Um, there's a revolving door, for lack of a better way of saying it, it's probably the best, between our congressional representatives and the military industrial complex. The decision to make war, as I mentioned earlier, is made by people who have very little experience in the military. And you probably see this show up sometimes where military strategists will say, no, we're against this, but the political representatives who have deep investments in militarism say, no, let's go forward with this. Uh, the military industrial complex is an educational complex as well. Recruiting young people to serve in the military, especially from poor districts, uh, encouraging educational institutions to uh, propagate pro-war and pro-military service materials, uh, using taxpayer-funded monies to do research for new weapon systems that are then sold back to the American taxpayer by way of the private corporations that own the patents for those weapon systems. Uh, it is also a cultural complex where we are encouraged at every turn, and it seems more and more, to celebrate the military as an essential aspect of our national identity. So between flyovers at the Super Bowl and every sporting event, it seems nowadays, where people cheer on without necessarily knowing that those jets are costing as much money as they are, uh, to video games and programs that promote the idea uh, that the military is just doing a professional job to protect us, all the kinds of things 
uh, that I mentioned earlier. The two films, uh, Argo and Zero Dark Thirty, were liberal Hollywood's contribution to militarism, again avoiding any consideration of the role of the United States in supporting repressive regimes and really what the real role of the military is. Uh, finally, I want to add in terms of the nature of the complex that it's a patriarchal complex as well. The military may be, I think in some respects, uh, and, and the statistics, which I'll give you here in just a second, perhaps the supreme embodiment of patriarchal values in terms of hierarchical control, uh, in terms of the affirmation of the capacity to control and exercise power over others, to never show weakness, to act without regard to the suffering of others, including other persons, other species, and the earth, the affirmation and celebration of the ability to hurt others, to cheer on this capacity as manifestations of one's personhood, uh, authenticity. It's probably not surprising that every year the Department of Defense uh, indicates that on average 19,000 women serving in the armed forces are sexually assaulted. The, and the, the estimate is that it's probably closer to one out of three, given the nature of this cultural context. While a disproportionate number of women serving in the military are assaulted or murdered by their military partners. One might consider the high rates of suicide among veterans may derive in part from the psychological violence resulting from killing other people, witnessing killing happening to their friends, to their comrades. We have to consider how young people, and especially young men in this nation, can ever hope to learn something other than solving their problems in a nonviolent fashion as long as we glorify the military and lead the world in using weapons to impose our will on others. And am I at time? You have one minute. One minute. <laughs> um, I was going to do costs. Let me just do what you've already seen. So let me just do a couple slides here really quickly. So casualties from the War on Terror and 9-11, to give you some sense of the percentage, the red sliver are the number of people killed on 9-11. And what follows is a rough and admittedly estimate of the number of killed in defense of this country following 9-11. Just to give you a sense of what sometimes in Catholic uh, war theory is called proportionality. Right, and just talk about how far I can talk about civilian casualties. Brown University just released a report this past week uh, estimating that about, they think about 100, well, not about, actually, in this case, uh, they have um, converging records, about 120 to 130,000 civilians killed in Iraq following the U.S. invasion. John Hopkins University estimates the number is probably closer to a million persons, um, just to give you some sense of the cost. And since we're going to cover some of that um, of terms of cost, I'm just going to skip to the end and say that my take on this is that part of our challenge is that there are companies that are deeply invested in the perpetuation of militarism and of military spending, that we have an economy and a way of life that is saturated with military-related production, and that we've developed a kind of dependence on this production at a lot of levels, not just economically, not just politically, but also psychologically and culturally. And I want to just then finish really quickly here with this image, which is that just in the months leading up to the Iraq war, people from around the world, not just in the United States, among those of us who went to Washington, D.C. and in other cities, who protested against the imminent plans for the invasion of Iraq, but literally, in cities around the world, a remarkable thing happened, which is that anywhere between 30, and the estimate is about 50 million people, marched in cities and villages everywhere, protesting the plan to invade Iraq, and called for the United States to forego that project and look for nonviolent solutions to the problems that they face. Steven Pinker, the linguist at Harvard, has argued that we are as a species, as shocking as this might sound, moving to becoming a less violent species on the planet. That we kill, by percentage, much fewer of each other than we ever have in history. And so I want to suggest that in fact this is the overwhelming curve of history. To move toward nonviolent solutions to our problems, and I think we have the opportunity 
to help the people of the United States get on that curve and join the rest of the world to create a world that is sane and healthy and safe uh, for all of us. And I look forward to our conversation about that.